Good afternoon, welcome to the tower. This is the afternoon session, as you may have noticed, from the fact that you're all half asleep from lunch. Um, we are going to put Franz in a slightly unique position here, and he will be delivering his talk sitting down. So welcome to the Debian installer, Boff. Thank you very much. I'll try to do as much as I can standing up. Uh, this is a workshop, a long one, and I was quite upset to hear during lunch that the organization has planned a trip to a church or something that starts during this talk. If anybody plans to go there, I'd prefer it if you'd leave now or decide to stay for the whole workshop. Um, the setup is a bit strange. That is because my laptop display doesn't uh, show what I'm typing, so I have to be looking at the screen when I have to do some typing, and I have planned a few demos and stuff. I've asked the organization to warn me if there's people behind me that would like to ask questions, so just stick up your hand and hopefully somebody will see it. So the subject is Debian install internals. I'm going to I'm going to walk you through uh, the installation methods that the installer offers. I'm going to be running the installer together with you. Uh, we're going to debug a bit. We're going to uh, build a UDEP. That should, should be there. Forgot the section title. And we're going to be building installer images, including that UDEP, and see if it will run. So that should be quite a nice setup. OK, well, that's a bit of a redundant slide. Some resources that are important. First of all, the Debian installer mailing list, where all development communication takes place. Uh, the Debian installer project website, the wiki, We've moved a lot of information from the uh, website to the wiki, and it's, it's fairly actively maintained. Uh, there's one special resource I would like to mention, and that's the homepage of the development version of the manual, which is on Aliot. It's linked from the project homepage, of course. And if you want to do anything with the installer, you need an SVN checkout. So what installation methods do we have and how are they composed and how do they differ? Um, you can recognize or a, 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 an installation consists of a number of stages and these are listed here. I think most should, this should be familiar to most people. The stages can differ between installation methods, and that's basically what, uh, that's one characteristic of them. So here I've listed the, the sequence of components that are run when you do a i386 netboot or CD-ROM install. Um, for other architectures, there are some differences. Some have really specialized installation methods that are using specialized UDEPs, but the basic flow is the same. And this is for stages one to three. Stages four and five we will see after on the next slide. The first bit is not really part of stage at all, but that's uh, when you do automated installs using InnerTRD preceding, which means that you include a preceed file inside the InnerTRD. And that's read automatically by the installer. Then you get language and country selection, which determines the locale, keyboard chooser, and then it starts to diverge. 
for uh, CD-ROM installation, you need to be able to load the additional components the installer needs from the CD. So you need to detect the CD. And you need to, to do some hardware detection. While if you're doing netboot, you will have to detect your Ethernet card uh, and configure it. The next line is again preceding, but different methods. If you do a CD-based install, you can do file preceding. If you do uh, a network-based install, you can do network preceding. That means loading the pre-configuration file from the network. No. We haven't done that config yet. So, no, I've not. It's there, phase three. Um, after we've basically set up the access to the extra source for UDEPs, we need to load them. So that's the next step, which is either load CD-ROM or download installer, and both call ANA, which is not nearly apt, but almost, uh, to actually load them. And then on non-network-based installs, well, you still want to set up the network because you may need it later on, and you will need a network configured for the installed system anyway, so we might just might as well just do it here. Stages four and five are basically similar for all installation methods. Uh, first, some more hardware detection, mainly to uh, find drivers for your hard disks. Uh, partitioning and a number of configurations uh, that were that used to be in base config basically but this has all been moved to the first stage of the install before the reboot now then we run base installer which co calls uh, the bootstrap and set up your uh, base system and in the end base installer will allow you to select a kernel or will select one automatically for you depending on the priority you're installing. And it will install some extra packages. Uh, for the kernel you need a bootloader uh, and it will do, for example, uh, locals, it, it will install the locals package. After base installer, we have to set up apt for the target system so we can install tasks. And that's the function of uh, apt setup. That will set up either a, a CD-ROM source or and or a network source, and it will try to add a security mirror. Then we are on package cell, which is basically uh, an, a new app, uh, a component that will call task cell. So then you get the selection of tasks like the desktop task, the print task, and so on. Bootloader installation, and then we are ready for the cleanup. And that used to be pre-base config, but because we got rid of base config, it was time to rename it, and so we've now called it Finish Install. That was done this week, I think. So besides the flow of, of UDEPs, um, the installation method is determined by four characteristics. How is the installer booted? From where are the additional UDEPs retrieved that you need? from where are packages for the base system retrieved by the bootstrap, and from where do you get the packages needed for the installation of tasks. Well, this gives a 
quite a full overview of all the installation methods supported. There, there are a few that, that differ, uh, amongst others the S390 installation methods. Um, but you see there's kind of a flow from fully network-based to more CD-based. Uh, some people may not be familiar with the mini ISO. The mini ISO is a CD image, which is not generated by Debian CD, but is generated as a kind of byproduct of the netboot installation method. Uh, it's the same initRD, but dropped onto an ISO image with ISO Linux bootloader. That makes it extremely useful for testing purposes because you can generate it in like uh, under a minute and you can boot it immediately uh, in an emulator or something like that without having to copy it to a, uh, a, net, a boot server or having to generate the full CD images using uh, Debian CD or something. Any questions at this stage? Yes? Sorry, could we could you wait for the mic? So does that mean the mini ISO is pretty much empty? Yes, it's pretty much empty. It 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 contains just just what needed uh, to get to here to the end of stage two. And the rest is all loaded over the network. So you need a good mirror uh, available. Okay. So running the installer. I have here a very recent business card image. And well, this is a familiar screen. What you may have seen in the announcements is that we can now do, oh, I need to. We have a new uh, installation option which is the graphical installer, and I just want to show it because I'm very proud that we managed to integrate it into the main installer, finally. It has a somewhat bigger init ID than most, uh, than the regular nude-based installation methods, but uh, we feel that it's... <laughs> Thank you, we think that's well worth it. Uh, it needs, still needs some work. It would be nice to get this aligned, but that's basically a hang hangover from the uh, Newt installation method where you have uh, non-proportional characters. But we hope to be able to fix that at some point in the future. Uh, the main advantage of the graphical installer is, of course, that it allows us to add languages that have script sets that, would, are not, that we are not able to support in the Newt front end. So it's, it's really an internationalization uh, advance, which Christian, of course, is extremely happy about and allows him to find even more translators for the installer. Uh, Franz, what uh, toolkit is the graphical installer programmed in? It's programmed in GTK. It uses GTK libraries with everything that's underneath that, like Pango, uh, ATK, ATK. Uh, and it runs on the frame buffer, direct frame buffer. Okay, well, I'm not going to actually run through the whole install with you. Uh, we will do some more bits later on, but let's go back to the presentation for now. Uh, that's the wrong key.
Okay, so what happens when you boot the installer? Um, first, based on the type of InnerTRD, we have uh, either init or has been init is started. And those will do some very early initializations, like making sure that some devices are uh, present. And after that, they will co both call busybox init, which parses etc in a tab. That runs two uh, sets of two scripts, and those scripts each do a run parts on different directories. Uh, some parts, some scripts will be just run, others will be sourced. And finally, the init tab will set up a VT2 for a shell, VT3 for farlock messages, which we don't use anymore, They're, that's tailed, and VT4 for the syslog, which basically, basically now contains all debugging and uh, log information. And one important thing is that uh, the most of those scripts come from the root scale uh, UDAP, and scripts can be architecture specific. At the end of the, or not really at the end, because the real end is shutting down the installer, but near the end of the Debian installer scripts, uh, the main menu is started, and that basically um, manages the whole rest of the installation. It is running, even though you may not see it at uh, critical and high priority, but it's still there running and managing it, and you can always go back to the, m to the menu using the go back button. During normal install, you will mostly run at high priority. Um, critical priority is mostly used for preceded uh, installs, automatic installs, while, well, personally I use medium priority a lot because it doesn't show all the uh, really annoying detailed questions, but still gives you the main menu and thus more control over the flow of the installation. You know that every step you will uh, have a point where you could say, okay, I want to switch to shell, and I want to uh, add some debugging information, or I want to look at state of the installer, which is not possible with high priority. So I, I really use uh, medium priority a lot. Uh, low priority, of course, is for export install installs, and at export install, you, you get all those really weird options that nobody ever uses anymore, like module parameters and Stuff like that. The menu is dynamically assembled, which is needed, of course, because you don't have the full set of UDEPs right from the beginning. So basically, after every step of the installation finishes, it will read the available the control file to see which UDEPs are available and will rebuild the menu from scratch. Uh, the order of menu items is, de is determined by two things. One is the dependencies between UDEPs. If a UDEP depends on another one, the other one will always end up higher in the menu. Um, and the second is the menu item, which, will we, see, which we will see later. The menu item, it's, it's a number in the range from one to 99 at the, at the moment. Uh, that if there are no priority uh, conflicts, the menu item will determine the order. But they may, may be out of order if you look at what's actually displayed because of priorities. If you install a UDEP normally, it will only be unpacked if it's displayed, it's, if it's a UDEP a component that's displayed in the menu. So the post in script will not be run. That's a bit different from uh, what happens in, in a normal system. If you have a UDEP that's not displayed in the menu and that has a po post in script, 
most don't, but you can have one, then the post inst will be uh, run during the installation of the UDAP. For UDAPs that are displayed in the menu, the post inst will be run when it's selected from the main menu, either automatically or manually by selecting menu item. So that means that you could say that uh, the main menu is responsible for configuring UDAPs if you compare it to uh, a normal system. It also means that post ins really have to be uh, idempotent. They have to be run, you have to be able to run them multiple times and basically get the same result every time, which is a, a rather important development uh, topic to th think about. And there are some components that are available at the bottom of the menu but are not run automatically. And those include uh, saving log files, uh, aborting the installation, uh, changing the depth priority, stuff like that. So here is two uh, packages as they look in the uh, status file that should read status file in the title, um, on the running installer. And here you can see the menu item, uh, net CFG has a lower one than choose mirror. But as choose mirror depends on a configured network, which is provided by net CFG, the order would be uh, net CFG first and choose mirror after anyway. As I said before, the, depend, the, the order is first de determined by dependencies. It also shows that you can use virtual packages to uh, have more than one component provide the same functionality. Uh, we also have at the moment different partitioning programs and that, uh, that provide like uh, a setup file system or a partition or, or swap partition, stuff like that. The installer, well, uh, a, a, a base design uh, policy has always been for the installer to keep it very modular, to, to keep it very flexible, to be able to drop in functionality um, where needed. And hooks are a method that, that offer that flexibility. So the installer uses hooks quite liberally. And you see some ex examples here that are run at the different parts of the installation process. So if you have a UDAP that is run quite early in the process, but also has a, something that needs to be done later on in the process, you select the correct uh, hook directory, you drop in a script there in your rules file, and it will be executed then. The, well, you can see what the most used uh, places are just before the bootstrap is run. Um, after the base system has been installed, but before the kernel is selected, so you could even say, okay, I want uh, to select a different kernel there. And at the end, right at the end of the installation, uh, when things are cleaned up and the last configuration bits are written to the target system. There are some other hooks that are not used so much and that are really specialized. Um, you can drop things in libmainmenu.d. Uh, those are will be picked up by the, by the main menu uh, program. I'm not even sure what exactly they do, but if you're interested, you can find out. Um, the upset up generators, those are run when upset is called and you have different generators to set up uh, a CD-ROM app source or a mirror app source and for the security mirrors. And 
Ubuntu even has a few scripts in our source repository for their uh, source setup. We don't use them, of course, but it's easier for them if they're part of the source so they don't have, so, so they have a, a smaller diff. And then there's Partman. And Partman is quite amazing. I'm, I've really only started working on Partman myself uh, this year. And Partman is one huge collection of hooks. There's almost nothing that isn't called as a hook script. It makes it a bit hard to get into, but once you see the basic structure of Partman, uh, I think you have to start to admire the guy who, um, who built it. There are a few special tools that are available, uh, mostly, mostly for use in uh, scripts. We have Ana install, which you can use to either schedule a UDEP for installation later, after uh, the, 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 the source where you can get the UDEP from has been set up, or it will be run immediately if it spots that the source already has been set up. So again, right in the beginning of the installation, for example, when uh, the language is selected, you can say, okay, I, this language has been selected. That means that later on in the installation, I would like to have this UDAP run. And even though you cannot load UDAPs at that moment, you can say, I want to do uninstall UDAP name, and it will be scheduled for later installation as soon as possible. The same goes for apt install, only that installs real depths into the target system, not into the installer environment. Then you have log output, which uh, allows you to run a command and redirect all its uh, output, be it to um, normal sysout or be it to syserror, uh, where you want, basically. Uh, it's mostly used to redirect in output to syslog. And then we have in target, which allows you to run scripts inside the target, inside the true root. Um, what in target does is set up the environment a bit more. So it will mount proc and sys and stuff like that and will unmount it again after the script finishes. So you do in target uh, command or in target script and it will true root execute script, ex uh, exit, and clean up. Which makes life a lot easier for us uh, since it had been written because we used to do that kind of setup in the scripts themselves and that's no longer needed. Well, there is a bit of proceeding, uh, or a bit in the, in the paper that I wrote for this conference about proceeding but I don't really want to go into that here. Uh, I'd like to refer you to that and to the appendix we have on proceeding in the installation guide. Um, it's important if you want to do proceeding for search that you use the search manual and if you want to do proceeding for either Edge or SID that you use the uh, installation guide on Elliot because there have been major changes Okay, now let's do some real development work. Let's try to fix the problem. And I've selected a problem that uh, we discovered yesterday and which Mark Heimer and Stephen Graham helped us debug together with a guy on IRC who has done a lot of work on Partman Crypto recently and the four of us finally tracked it down. So. Let's try it if we can still do it. I will first need to load um, a snapshot that I prepared earlier. Is this still audible?
if that's this one. Uh, in this image, I have run the installer up to partitioning, basically. Um, I've started the installation at medium priority to have the full control over it, and you can see it's an empty disk. There's nothing yet on it. And what I want to do first is to start a web server from the installer environment so that we can easily check what's in the log files. So for that, I will go back to the main menu and select the option Save Debug Logs. Here you have the three options, and the web server is by far the most used at the moment, at least by me and Joey, I would guess. It tells you the IP address, so Let's start a web browser. And as I've used the same address over and over again this week, it's already there. Is it there? Yay. So here you have the SIFS lock basically up to now. And you just press F5 to get the new version with your latest debug information. This really makes debugging a lot easier than it used to be. When you had to use nano and you had far less crawling opportunity and you couldn't widen the screen, this really gives you uh, a lot of control. So the installers still knows that it's supposed to partition big disks net next. And the first thing we have to do is create a partition for LVM because the problem is in LVM. Let's create an MS-DOS partition. That's there. Create a new partition. Use the full size. Uh, it's going to be a primary. And we're going to use it as a physical volume for LVM. And that's basically it. So that's what we want. Now I'm going to take a snapshot to have our starting position for the debugging. And I will first show you the problem. We first have to confirm that we want to write the changes we've made to the partition table, because otherwise LVM won't work. And then we get the option to create volume groups. That looks nice, but that doesn't. We should be asked for volume group name or whatever. Joey, can we get a mic to you, please? Better? Okay. Well, let's do just, just do that again. Create volume groups and nothing happens. We should be asked for volume group name and so on. So let's switch to that one work. It's going to be take a lot of switching now. Refresh and see if we can find anything in the log. This one has been there for a while. 
we're still hoping that the parted, lip parted maintainers will fix this sometime. But that's not part of the problem. Well, this is basically part of starting Partman, so it's not there. And I cannot see anything really weird here either. So we need to start looking a bit deeper down. If I switch to the second console and go to uh, lip partman, here you have that beautiful set of hook script directories. And the main menu, the main screen, is uh, the choose partition one. So we have to look in the choose partition directory. And there you find under number 30, the LVM option. So let's look there. And here we have two files. Choices isn't very interesting. That basically just gives the, the name of the menu option. But if we look at do option, there we have a nice script. Partman is completely scripted, except for the interface to libparted, which is the parted server, and that's written in C. So nano is the editor that's available in DI. And let's just add, add a set min x to the script. Back to the installer. I'm going to back out just to make sure that the script is started from scratch. Uh, I don't know why this is shown. It should go back to the main menu, in my opinion. So we just answer no. And here we have the start of LVM again. So modify volume groups again, create volume groups, same error. And now we can check the logs again. And here you see, well, what happened there? Here you see the output from that script. Well, the interesting bit should be at the bottom, but it seems to run fine. which is, of course, not really what we wanted. I'm going to cheat a little bit. Ah, that's not here. Um, well, if you take a look at the source code of this script, you see that it's not really responsible for running these commands. But right at the bottom, you can see that it calls the LVM CFG script. So maybe we should try take a look at that. Um, let's see where it is. In bin LVM CFG. And let's try a set min x in that one. Um, we have a question here. Could we have a microphone, please? So Sorry. Yes, I will remove okay. that. Yeah. So nano do option and take that one out. Back here. Back out again so we know that the scripts are started cleanly.
and once again we go to check the log information and here we have something that looks not like what you'd like to see and well again you have to look at the code to see what's going wrong but basically this should this variable should be create because the script checks for it and it isn't so apparently there's something going wrong in that uh, echo set tr command sequence so let's see if we can reproduce the error let's go to I'm going to keep it like this for a little bit so I can just look in the debugging what the actual commands are. Um, as there is a set on the first space, it doesn't really matter what we type after that. But what is important is set minus E and then we have quote I know space and everything after it and close let's see what that does well that gives create that looks good and if we add the tr a to c i hope i'm not boring you steve and my because you've seen this already. <laughs> and allow, we have the segmentation fault right there. So let's check that it's really the TR command by removing the set. And yes. So now it's kind of time to file a release critical bug against BusyBox UDAP, which we did yesterday. Well, I hope this, this shows you some of how, how relatively easy it is to, to debug Debian installer because it's all scripted, because you have access to the logs in a fairly easy uh, manner. Uh, there's a few C programs that will require a bit more effort, but you can get S trace into the installer environment uh, you can do you can add debugging commands in your C program to, to, to make it display information uh, comp compile the UDEP drop it in there are several techniques for that which I won't go into detail now but I hope I, I will, will be able to add them to the paper later and uh, well we've never really been completely stuck debugging things Any questions? Can we get a mic, please? No, no. How am I supposed to get S trace into the environment? Is there a UDAP for that, or? There is UDAP for it. Uh, you will need to either include it uh, into the InnotRD when you build it, and I will show you later who you, how you can do that. Um, or you have to set up networking or access to a USB stick and uh, add it from there. Yes. Uh, there's a question from IRC from Raphael Gizzard. Could you please ask if there's going to be a QT front end for the installer? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can expand that question by asking if there's going to be a X backend for the installer. Um, at the moment, we don't have plans for any of that, but we also don't exclude it. Um, I heard this week that Trolltech has some plans to go into this direction a bit more, so who knows if it proves to be superior technology and the changeover is not too big, we might. Uh, but for now, we're quite happy with what we've been able to achieve using DirectFB and GTK. And there's a second question from Orlando File. Is the custom Debian distro toolkit finished? 
the Debian distro toolkit. I'm not sure that I understand what is meant by that. Joey, do you have any clue? The custom Debian distro cool toolkit. Wait for Mike, please, Joey. I know that the CDD people are working on um, making ways to make customized DI CDs and so on. Um, I don't really know much more than that. I haven't looked at it. Okay. Um, well, I have attended the buff early this week by Fragrant, um, who has been doing uh, Geek something, which is about recycling, Free Geek, which is about recycling old computers. And they have developed uh, something called Simple CDD, which can be used to, I understand, I, we have, I haven't look at, looked at it yet, but which, which can be used to generate uh, CD images like using Debian CD, I think, it's, it's a front to Debian CD, and which also includes some pre-configuration stuff. So that, that would be something to look into to, for, for easy uh, CD creation. I hope that answers the questions. Uh, Franz, going back to the uh, QT uh, bindings or interface, wouldn't that depend upon a QT uh, layer on top of frame buffer? And does that exist? I haven't got a clue, but yes, at the moment it would be depend on uh, Q Q uh, direct FB support. Um, unless, of course, we, we, we should go back to X, but um, as I understand it, I, I'm not a technical expert on, on, on this in this area, but as, as I understand, the X backend is, is, is heavier than the Directive B uh, backend. Sorry, if, yeah, the people at home cannot follow. Yeah, well, a Q, a QT for the frame buffer C, uh, certainly does exist, but it's uh, what Q, uh, Trolltech has been selling to their paying customers. And, well, the, the, the free version is just, uh, it's just capable of doing X and nothing else. Okay. Uh, as, as a teaser. Thank you for the information. Dario. Hi, yeah. Uh, what are the memory requirements for the graphical installation? Um, for the normal installation, let me start off by that. We try to support uh, 32 MB, and the last beta release still managed that for IP86. Uh, for the graphical installer, we have started with a fairly large init RD. Um, the memory requirements for that were set to be safe at 96 MB. Uh, the NFTD has shrunk a lot since then, mainly because we managed to uh, deal a lot smarter with fonts. We stripped unused uh, characters out of them. So it's, it's really lean and just what we need for, to, to support the languages we have. Um, although if Google has this way, we will need extra fonts and extra fonts and extra fonts. So it will grow again. Um, but I don't know what the current memory requirements are. We are hoping that we can get it down to 64 MB, which we think is a fairly uh, sane uh, requirement for a graphical installer. And the installer will switch back automatically to the new front end if that uh, is not met. So okay. you will be able to install anyway, even if, if you have less memory. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The mic over there. Um, could you please ask what are the processor requirements for the GUI installer? Um, well, I've so far, well, you can, you, you saw that it runs fine in an emulated environment. Uh, my laptop is, 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 is a nice one, but it's not uh, extremely strong for, for current standards. It runs nice in an emulated environment, so it's should run fine on, on well, uh, basically anything Pentium 3 and higher, I would say, with, with uh, decent. Okay, I hear it works fine on the Pentium 200, so. Yeah. Over time, okay, let's move on.
well, we've already done it, so. Uh, this is the missing caption, creating UDAPs. What are UDAPs? Well, UDAPs are basically just Debian packages, DEPs, but with some special characteristics. They're optimized for size, they, and because they need to be optimized for size, they have relaxed policy requirements. Um, you don't need to include a license and documentation and st stuff like that into the UDAP itself. A license has, of course, to be available into the source package, but not into the UDAP itself, be basically because nobody will ever look at it or be interested in it. Uh, you need to keep the install small so that you can boot the entire D fully into memory and a lot of the installation is run in memory only. Only after you have run partman, set up a swap, does the swap become available so you can kind of increase your memory usage. But up to that time you really need to be, to try to be as lean as possible. That's also one of the reasons why a uh, long ago decision was made to only use C and shell inside the installer to, to develop it. Um, the, there is basically at the moment, although there are some plans to, to change that at least uh, to, to some basic functionality, there's no version management. So once you've installed the UDAP, you cannot upgrade it or whatever. There is an option to remove it, but even that is not fully guaranteed to remove everything. The, the functionality is limited of, of t the, the, the packaging tools. Creation of UDAP is fully supported by DEP Helper. If you use dpackage dev, you will have to do some ugly workarounds, be, for instance, to force the UDAP extension in the file name. Um, but DEP Helper, uh, if you tell it that you're creating a UDAP, will basically do everything for you. It will strip the, the documentation and the license uh, and so on, it, it will skip steps and, and do other steps with special options. Um, I've listed a few types of UDEPs, um, mostly for information. I'm not sure if I'm complete there, but these are the, the main ones. And of course, not all UDEPs that are used in the installer are written by the Debian installer team itself. We use a lot of UDEPs that cre are created as a byproduct of normal packages or normal library packages. This is a very nice uh, feature that was added recently and that actually allowed us to integrate the graphical installer into the main built environment. Uh, up till a few months ago, if you ran uh, DH SA SH lip SA lip dep, deps. Uh, terrible words to pronounce. Um, you would get dependencies on the normal libraries instead of the UDEPs. Why? Because the SA lib files that are included in every uh, library package just didn't know about UDEPs. So they couldn't tell the package, okay, this is uh, for a UDEP, so you need to include uh, a dependency on a UDEP instead of the normal library. So that basically meant that uh, dependencies for libraries were fucked. And that caused a lot of problems when building uh, UDEPs and when building the installer because, well, basically it would do the wrong thing. It would try to load the DEP instead of UDEP. So what has been added is uh, type support in deep package dev. And it's currently only used for UDEP, but it could be used for other types of, of packages. And you can see that a second line is added in the SH, SHlib files, uh, starting with UDEP colon. And the, instead of referring to the name of the normal library, it will refer to the name of the UDEP. And to generate that extra line, you have to do something like that in your rules file. The magic is in the add UDEP option. So
so what um, when creating a, a UDEP, there's two special things in the control file in the Debian directory. And those are XEPackage type UDEP, which is the line that tells uh, Deb helper that we are building a UDEP, and so it will activate all that special build functionality. And the second one, which is only used for UDEPs that are supposed to end up in the menu, is the XB installer menu item. In this case, it's 12. So let's try to, um, yes, question there, microphone please. Is there any reason for the XC, XB? Uh, that's in policy, I think. No? Can we get a mic to Joey? The X is of course for extended since it isn't a defined field. The B means it goes into the binary package and the C means that it's only present in the source control file. Um, Frank? Um, would it be, would the uh, installer team like that dpkg dev uh, adds more features from that are currently uh, encapsulated in dev helper to dpkg dev itself, like supporting installer menu item and stuff like that without dx uh, prefix, or is it, yeah, do you like the fact that you don't have to file a bug against dpkg dev if you want to change that? Well, um. we do get all kinds of errors because of these lines uh, when we're building the package. And it would be nice to get rid of them. Uh, so yes, we would like that. If, uh, if you say, okay, I've now done all the 3,000 bucks that are open against the package and I'm ready for something new. Um, then no, the, the bugs <laughs> against the package not actually, but the D package dev uh, bug list is pretty much under control, I okay. think. And so, you can certainly add some wish list bugs there and okay. you have a good chance to get them merged. So. Okay, thank you very much. So getting back to the sli uh, slides, what is the one killer feature that most installers have but Debian installer mi lacks? Does anyone want to have a guess at this? <laughs> Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is something we have been thinking about and even have been working towards. Uh, it isn't there yet, but I think it will be a feature that will be added post-edge. <laughs> or n whatever, but uh, we are looking at several options. Joey had a very nice one earlier this week that he showed to me. Um, but yes, we will be looking into adding games, but that's not the one I was talking about. Well, let me just show you. <laughs> Well, we are going to fix it. <laughs> uh, I really have to, to give the credits for that to Martin Selwell Helas. He uh, IRC'd me on uh, April the 1st, <laughs> requesting this or something like it. So I thought, well, it, it could make for a nice demonstration package. Of course you need an SVN checkout and I need to set up my set route for this. I can try to do that. Too tiny? Well, let's make it full screen then.
um, Although this is supposed to be a workshop and it would be better if you could all follow along, I'm afraid that would take too much time. So I have done a fair amount of presentation and I will basically walk you through the files that are included in the UDAP and explain a bit about what's in them and why it's there. Uh, instead of doing it all together, I think that that makes more sense for, for, this, uh, for this meeting than really having you try to build your own UDAP that would take uh, a slower tempo than, than I have time for at the moment. So let's see what we have here. Well, the first file that's there, check license, is the super secret C program that is going to check if the license key is actually valid. Um, so that's basically compiled already. Uh, the Debian directory we have, of course, and we have finish install D, which is where we can, uh, which is one of the uh, hook script directories. And what we have there is copy license with uh, uh, number 10 before it to, to help set the order of the, of the scripts. So that will be copied into the user lib um, finish install D directory on installation and well this is only an example so I've made it fairly simple just copy each C license as it's created uh, during the check of the key to target and that's basically all that's in the root directory for the UDAP. All interesting stuff is in the Debian directory. And well, this shouldn't come as much as, as of a surprise to most people familiar with packages. It's, it's all basic what's in, in all other uh, packages. The change log is just an initial version. In the DI repository, we use unreleased when there have been changes since the last upload. So we can easily see what UDAPs are, uh, need to be checked when we are going to release. Um, that's needed because there's quite a few people who work on uh, UDAPs at the same time. We don't have really uh, ownership of UDAPs, although we have main maintainers of some of them. A compat is for Deb helper. Controlled file we will work on a bit later. The DIRS file contains the two DIRS that need to be created, uh, user lib, finish, install D, and sbin. Um, let's take a look at the templates file. That has a few templates. Uh, one, the first one is to enter the key. The second one is to ask the user a question if he should enter an em empty one, which of course is invalid. The third one if, is if he does enter a key, but the check license script returns an error. Um, the fourth one, is, uh, will be shown when a correct license key is entered. And I've made it a bit secret by using two variables that will be set from uh, that secret binary that we have. Um, we have a message that will be shown on a board because we're going to reboot the system and it's not very nice to do that without announcing it. And we have the title that's going to be entered into the main menu. The underscore be before the description fields means that all these are translatable, except for the uh, confirmation one, 
which we should of course solve because otherwise Christian will be unhappy, but well, we will have to do, deal with that later at some time. Um, the rules file. There's also not very much special in that. Um, I've created a, a scripts variable where you can list one or more scripts that need to be dropped into hook directories. And the small loop that's in the build target or the install target uh, will put those scripts in the, the, the correct location. And we have to install the uh, check license binary. And as you see, for the rest, there, is, there are no special options needed on the dep helper commands to generate the UDEP. For a lot of UDEPs, the main, the, the most functionality is contained in the posting script, and it's the same here. So there's a function that is called on error uh, with the parameter uh, of the, the template to be shown. So that's either uh, license UDEP invalid or license UDEP empty. And there is uh, an endless loop that will keep asking the, uh, the license key until either the user chooses to abort or um, a correct key is entered. The PO directory is of course for translations. There are currently none in there, but there is a template file, so translators, translators could start on this. And we have control file, which at the moment only has the source, so we will need to add the binary. So that is package license UDEP. Then we need to tell Dep Helper that we are working with a UDEP, that we're trying to create a UDEP. So we need the XC package type um, UDEP. As it contains the secret binary, we need to make it architecture any, which also means, of course, that the current setup will fail as we, I've only included one binary, and we will basically need one per architecture. Well, we can build it, it wouldn't be secret <laughs> otherwise, so. But we'll still make it architecture any. Priority standard, because we really want this to be, Let's do it like this. Uh, because we want to, this to be run by default, if you make uh, a UDEP that contains a menu item optional or extra, it will not be included in the menu by default, but only when there are dependencies requiring uh, that UDEP. We need some dependencies. Uh, for MISC and as ellipse. We will need a description. Let's keep it at this for now. And because we want it to be shown in the main menu, we will need a menu item. But which? And for that, I'm going to make a short excursion to 
projects, DI, installer, documentation, development, and there you have a lot of documentation that can be relevant when you're working on the installer. I'm kind of hoping that I can ex extend the paper I've written for this DEPCONF to uh, be more like a DI developer's reference manual and that we can include a lot of the information that's currently here into that manual or into appendixes in that, in that, uh, in that reference guide. But currently you can find a lot of information here. And we need the menu item numbers text. And here you can see that local chooser is run at 10. Then we have load floppy, which isn't used that often. Um, but basically we want to use, run this UDEP after local chooser and before anything else. So let's give it menu number 11 as well. Um, the last thing that I've skipped is the copyright file. And well, that's going to be a bit of a problem, which I've solved by doing this. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's go down one level and do a the build. Well, that looks good. There are some weird warnings about extra license file, which is just because I've used words that it apparently checks on in uh, in other files. Uh, and no standards version field is a warning you will see quite often for UDEP because it's not uh, required. And well, we use that unreleased release di distribution name, so it complains about that too. Should I move it up a bit? So now if we look down, you can see I made it, I had a typo early on, so it's now with a C and with an S, but yes, it's correct, and it's the one that we just regenerated. Well, that's how you build the UDEP. Nothing to it. So the last subject, and we have a quarter of an hour left, so, so that should work quite, quite nicely, is building an actual image. And let's try to build one and test the UDAP we've just created. A question there? Uh, the skeleton that you started from, is that just something you had around? Or I was thinking, I was wondering if it might be useful to have something like a DHMake uh, target that could give you a nice skeleton for a UDAP or? Well, what I normally do is, is take a fairly bare uh, UDEP that I, n I know. There's about 30 or 40 uh, available in the SVN repository. Uh, copy that and delete everything I know I, I won't need and edit the rest. That's, uh, that's my working method, but that's basically because I'm not a real developer. I'm just uh, <laughs> uh, uh, somebody who, who, who steals from others and modifies. There are probably other people who, who will start from scratch and do it in the correct way. This, this UDEP would need serious review anyway, so, yeah. So most of the images that, uh, or the installation methods that I've shown you at, in the beginning are ready for use, like the HD media installation method, the, the mini ISO, the netboot image. Uh, the one uh, exception are the images that are for CD-ROM. Those really need the CD-ROM environment because, well, basically we only built the InterD and the kernel. Uh, so you, you need to embed it on a CD together with the remaining UDEPs that need to be loaded together with uh, ISO Linux or whatever bootloader you need for your architecture. Um, 
and if depending on the type of image uh, packages for installation of the target system. The exception to the exception is the mini ISO, which is self-contained and uh, is generated as part of the I image generation. And of course, images can be built separately or as part of a release. What's involved in doing a release for Debian installer? Well, basically you start doing dpkg build package after checking your change log and so on. You do the upload and then you have, have to wait for a long time because the FTP masters have to do by hand processing of the upload because uh, there's a tarball that needs to be extracted to a certain location on the mirror and some uh, symlinks have to be set there to make the installation images available for uh, download and for uh, the Debian CD people who will build, build the CD images from it. And the irritating part is that the buildies for the other architectures will only kick in after the by-hand processing has happened. So that's what happened next. And then for each of the architectures, again, there has to be some by-hand processing. We hope that that will be automated at some point in the future. What are the requirements for building? For the, if you want to build from, from the, the current de development version, you need to run unstable or unstable chirut. You need an SVN checkout of trunk. You need to get the build dependencies for Debian installer. And you need to have a mirror available where the UDEPs that, are, that will be uh, included in the image can be downloaded from. And you have two choices there. You can use the default sources list UDEP, which is gen generated based on, your, on the sources list that's set up for the regular system. So it will copy some information for, from there and add Debian installer section uh, of the archive as, as, uh, as a parameter. Or you can use uh, sources list do that manual and then you can add basically any source you would like to include, which can be useful for building uh, images for testing. Although there's a more convenient uh, mechanism available as well, which I will come to a bit later. To build the SARS installer, you need, of course, a SARS environment and a checkout of the SARS branch in SVN and not the trunk. So the structure of the, uh, build, uh, the build system, it looks quite complex, but it's, uh, it's a very hierarchical uh, structure. Um, and because it's, it uses make, uh, it, it goes through those, this, that structure in a recursive way. Uh, the, the build targets that are available are, are generated dynamically from the definitions in, in various directories. And I've listed the main directories that are used in, in the, the build of system below that. Uh, a little bit in order of, of, of importance. The config directory contains, and we will look at those uh, a bit later. The config directory defines available targets. Package list defines which UDEPs will be used inside a particular image. The boot directory contains con configuration files used to set up, to, to make an image bootable. Local UDEPs is the alternative to, to, to adding extra uh, mirror sources that I mentioned just now. Uh, you can just drop a UDEP, a newer version than is in the, on the mirrors or, e or an equal version uh, into the local UDEPs directory. And if the UDEP is, uh, should be included in the image, it will first check local UDEPs and then check the mirror uh, to include it. So that's very useful for testing. You can just 
drop a UDAP in there, and we will we'll do be doing that for 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 this test case. Uh, util contains helper scripts. Uh, temp is where you will find the full tree of the contents of the initRD after it has been built. So if you want to check if everything is there, uh, or if you want to, 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 to check sp uh, specific files, uh, you can always l take a look in temp. And dest is where the images themselves, after they've been built, end up together with some log files and manifest files. One important step in uh, the build of uh, an install image is library reduction, and that's basically used to minimize the size of the interdies. There's a bit more information about this in uh, the paper I wrote. And that's the last slide. So not, now let's go to the actual building of an image. So we need to go, uh, let's go one down. Well, you saw this, this is basically the, the set of UDEPs that we develop as the DI team. And if you look at Partman, there's a lot, there you can see all the different Partman components, which all drop, drop their hook scripts in the correct location. And if you look in kernel, you can see all the source files for the kernel UDEPs that are generated for all architectures. Uh, some have still have 2.4 variants, but I suspect we will be dropping them pretty soon. To build the image, we need to go into installer, which is where the Debian installer package is built from, which is uploaded. If you run uh, debuild or dpkg build package here, you will end up with the Debian installer package. We used to have the manual in here as well, but sometime last year we separated that and created a separate source package for the installation guide. <coughs> to build individual images, you go to the build directory, and here you see all those, let me do a, Uh, really clean so you can see what's really there when you check it out. And here you see the directories I uh, listed earlier. And while well, the needed characters one is, is a special one that's not really uh, that interesting. I'm running a little bit short of time, so I'm going to switch to uh, building the image first and we'll see if we have uh, questions after that. And if not, I will go into the, the contents of directories a bit more. But there are examples in the paper as well, so I don't think it, it's really needed. If I do plain make, you will see that it, it will go into the config directory and basically check which targets are available and list them. There's a lot of targets that you will never use, so um, what we can do is, well, should ask at a grab there. Thank you. I just got an extension. <laughs> uh, these are the, the, the plain build targets. We also have rebuild targets that will do a little bit of cleaning before uh, starting a build. Uh, there are clean targets, uh, and the really clean target is a very important one as well. So, as I said, the mini ISO is a byproduct of uh, the netboot image, uh, and that's easy to test, so let's build a netboot image and does get the mini ISO. And as we wanted to include the UDEP we just created, 
I already copied that into local UDEPs a bit earlier. So now we do a fake root make build netboot. And let's uh, pipe that to or redirect that to a log file. Here you can see the list of UDEPs that it's going to be using, packs that it's going, or UDEPs that it's going to be downloading. Because I did a really clean, it has to get them from the mirror, but we seem to have fairly decent network connection. Kernel image is, of course, the largest thing to be downloaded, so that will take a little while. If I rebuild after this, it will go a lot quicker because it will keep the UDEPs that's already downloaded into uh, a cache directory. Well, let me take this opportunity to see if there are any questions. Philip Hans here. Not really a question, but it's a gotcha. If uh, because you. Uh, caches the packages, it also caches the things from local UDEBs. So if you crop another updated one without changing the version number, yeah. you get stitched and you keep on testing the wrong one. Yeah, uh, that's something that has been annoying me as well and I think we should uh, delete the packages file uh, in that directory or uh, anyway, we, we have to find a solution for that because you, you basically have to do a really clean now in order to test with a newly dropped in uh, UDEP into the local UDEPs. I agree with you. Yeah. Here in front. Mm. So there you seem to be using the SVN version, right? Yes, I'm using but, Trunk. Okay, but I saw that there are Debian installer packages in the archive. Can we start from it, or is something? Uh, Sorry, can, you can, can we start from the Debian installer packages which is in the archive to rebuild it, like apt get source it and go ahead, or there is something missing? Uh, no, you can start from that in principle, but it's not the preferred method. Um, if you do that, and especially if you use the last beta. There will be stuff in there that may not be usable anymore with the current UDEPs that are available. So really if, if, you, if you're trying to build for Trunk you, or for, for SART, you could probably do it because that's a fairly stable environment. But uh, in, in testing and unstable, it, it, there are so many changes that you really need to start with the most recent uh, environment. How far are we? Still downloading? Yeah. Another question. Yes, you mentioned that there was a way to build uh, testing installer images without having a testing environment. What was that way? Did I say that? Yeah. Doesn't sound familiar. Okay, so how, how would you build a testing installer? Uh, I guess that could be interpreted two ways. Um, one way uh, one way you could mean that is a, a, a the version of the installer using UDEBs from Edge, and the other okay. way is and the other way is uh, in, an installer that defaults to installing testing. Okay. Um, well, basically, when you're talking about that, you're not talking about building uh, an, an image, but more about assembling, for instance, a, a, a CD image from individual UDEPs. Um, and when, we, when you look at the Debian CD builds that are 
being done daily. We have two basic uh, sets of CDs. We have uh, the edge daily builds and we have the sit daily builds. One takes uh, UDEPs from testing and one takes UDEPs from unstable. If you look on the CDs themselves, you will always see actual packages from testing. So the CDs are always set up to install testing, not unstable, because the chance of installations breaking for unstable is just too big to, to make that the default. But we have two variations. Uh, normally, if you check the, the daily builds, uh, the links to the daily builds on the Debian installer homepage, they will point to the SIT images. So UDAPs taken from unstable. So you will be losing, you, uh, looking at the most recent uh, uploaded version of UDAPs. When we are preparing for a release, we will migrate the UDAPs that should go into the release to testing and switch the links for the daily images to using the edge CD images. So at that point, we will really be uh, using UDAPs from testing and um, packages from testing. If you look at intermediate times using uh, between releases, uh, looking at uh, HDI images isn't really that useful because basically nothing changes there. Uh, the, the weekly CD builds are a bit like that. They use the UDEPs from testing. So basically, that's still beta 2. Uh, but they have a, s a new snapshot of the depths from testing. So the, the, the weekly CD, CD builds are, are more for testing the installation of the target system than for testing the installer itself. I hope that's clear. It's, it's quite complex and I pro probably should write that out as well. Screensaver. That's not very interesting. This is taking a bit longer than I'd hoped. Uh, basically, it previously it downloaded the everything that's needed for the 2.6 init RD, and now it's downloading the kernel UDEPs for the 2.4 kernel. All the other UDEPs are already there, so it should not take too long. Just question the back there. Yes, uh, with respect to your floppy install images, I assume there is one of the targets to make floppies, but how do you specify in that UDEF control file to which floppies which UDEFs go? What is the process for that, to separate in them? Okay, that's uh, which UDEFs go into which image is uh, determined in the package lists directory. And there you will see all the image types available. That's not per architecture, but per image type, and you may have uh, variations between architectures on a, on, on a higher level. Um, but the package lists file uh, files uh, basically, okay, these UDEPs should be unpacked into this image. Well, we should be able to just make it. It's going through nicely now. I think it's done, really. This is just because I'm tailing it. Yep, done. So now I need to switch to here and do a little copy. Um, To here, power off. Change the CD image we use. 
I am bored to think. So here we have the language. I'll just select English because that will mean most people can read it. And, well, United States because they're font of licenses. And now we get the key map. Why don't we get the... We should have gotten the question about the... I think you might have forgotten to put the UW in the package lists or local UWs. Thank you. Let's see if we can correct that fairly quickly. You put the number in as well. Uh, so we switch back here and enlarge that. Um, VI package lists, uh, netboot, and here we have the architects below that. You can see the, the config file for i368, but we can also add a local file. And if we put the license UDAP in there, it should be added. Uh, let's look, take a quick look at the i386. Mm. Here you can see uh, a way that uh, or how, how it's determined which UDAPs are included, and you can see from the, the top line, include discover, that it's recursive. You can include other definition files into your definition files, so you don't duplicate too much, and if you have to make changes, you have to make the least changes possible. Uh, so now we have to run the build again, and let's do it without. Oh, sorry. I have to rebuild. This should go a lot quicker than just now. Um, Franz, are you rebuilding the 2.6 and NRD or the 2.4? Uh, both. Uh, rebuild, only rebuild the 2.4 with Netboot. Uh, Remember that fun. Well, we'll do the 2.6 afterwards then. Here you can see the library reduction, basically. I still have one second. And you also have to rebuild the other one because otherwise it doesn't get into it. You have to rebuild um, Netboot as well again? After, I3, after 2.6 because that's the way it's structured right now. It um, puts the 2.6 one inside an image containing the other one. It's sort yeah. of wacky. Right. It's one of the nice things to be able to fix when we drop 2.4, I guess. Well, be because of things like that, uh, I have basically uh, started, and because I have a local mirror, so my, my build times are very quick, I've basically started to always do really clean before uh, building. But thanks, Joey, for, for enlightening us into the, <laughs> the minor annoyances. I didn't want to do the download again, though. So one more time. I'm just glad your machine isn't as slow as mine. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to finish? I'll need two or three minutes.
Okay, almost there. Done. So now we can copy it again and then switch to VMware. Reset it. Okay. Let's go to full screen. And now here indeed we have the license key. So if I press enter, you get the option to retry. Does anyone yes have his license key at hand? <laughs> GPL? GPL? Okay, let's try it. I don't know. Okay, that's it. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention, everybody, and uh, let's enjoy the formal di formal dinner.